Hey, little buddies, it's Uncle Rick from the Uncle Rick Audio Book Club. And this is our weekly podcast, and today we've got a story I am really looking forward to reading to you. I think you're going to find it's very interesting and very exciting. I love adventure stories. This is about a young lady named Emily Geiger, and it's called Emily Geiger's Warning. This comes from With Whip and Spur by Lawton Evans, one of... uh, one of the more interesting books, I think, on the Uncle Rick Audio Book Club. You can read the thing from start to finish, or listen to it at least, if you're a member of the club. Anyway, let's begin. The American Revolution was in full progress. George Washington was the commander-in-chief of the Patriotic Army. His splendid height and soldierly bearing attracted attention wherever he went. His light blue eyes were deeply sunken under his brows, so that they gave him a grave and dignified expression. Washington was an excellent shot, a good swordsman, and a fine rider. When he was a young man, he excelled all his companions in wrestling and in throwing. He was fond of fine clothes and liked to go to parties and engage in social gatherings. He was one of the great generals of all times, and deserves the tribute that was paid him of first in war, first in peace, and first in the hearts of his countrymen. By the way, that compliment came from Light Horse Harry Lee, who was one of Washington's generals, and eventually became the father of Robert E. Lee, the great hero of the Civil War. After the Battle of Bunker Hill, Washington finally compelled the British to leave Boston. They retired to New York City, where Washington followed them. He was not strong enough, however, to drive them from New York, so he withdrew his army across New Jersey. Then came the Declaration of Independence. The colonists determined to fight for their independence and to become a separate nation. Richard Henry Lee of Virginia introduced a resolution in the Continental Congress at Philadelphia that, quote, these colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states. Thomas Jefferson, then 33 years of age and one of the youngest of the delegates, wrote the great document. When the declaration was adopted, John Hancock, the president, signed his name in a bold hand, so that, he said, the king could read it without his spectacles. By the way, that means the president, not of the United States, because there was a United States yet. He was the president of the Continental Congress, you see. The battles of Trenton and Princeton were fought, in which Washington captured many prisoners and gained a great victory over the British. General Burgoyne, a British commander, marched down from Canada to New York State. An American army retreated before him, burning bridges, cutting down trees across the roads, and doing everything they could to obstruct the British march. At Saratoga, the two armies met, and Burgoyne surrendered to the Americans. It was a great victory. The King of France said when he heard of it, The Americans are worthy of freedom, and we should acknowledge their independence and send troops to their assistance. Thereupon, the French made an alliance with the American colonies. Among the foreigners who came over to help America was the Marquis de Lafayette. He was hardly more than a boy, being 19 years old, but he was an ardent lover of liberty. While seated at a dinner table, he listened to someone giving an account of the struggle of the colonists for independence. He arose from the table, deeply moved, and he said, The welfare of America is the welfare of mankind everywhere. I am going to offer my services to General Washington. He had inherited a large fortune and, at his own expense, fitted out a vessel and sailed to America. He was made a major general and became a devoted friend of General Washington. And now came the terrible winter at Valley Forge. While the British were comfortably housed in Philadelphia, the soldiers of Washington spent a season of dreadful suffering. Many of the men had no blankets and were compelled to sit by a small fire all night long just to keep from freezing. Some perished from lack of food, and some died from want of clothes. The brave soldiers kept up their courage, however, and there were few deserters. When the winter was over, the British retired to New York, followed closely by Washington, who drew his lines around them and waited the result of the campaign which was going on in the southern colonies. The British had overrun Georgia and the Carolinas, An army was needed to stop their ravages, and Washington chose General Nathaniel Greene to take charge of that army. Greene was a great general, second only, perhaps, to Washington himself. 
The kind of warfare that was waged in the South was very different from what the British regulars had been accustomed to. The farmers would gather with their old muskets and rifles, agree to serve for a few weeks or months, fight the enemy whenever they appeared, and then return to their homes or disappear in the woods themselves. It was called guerrilla warfare, on account of its unusual and desultory nature. Francis Marion of South Carolina raised a company of his neighbors and called them Marion's Brigade. Yeah, I've got a book about Marion's men on the uh, club site. They served without pay, had no uniforms and no tents, and lived on the country as they went. They melted pewter mugs and dishes to make bullets and beat out old saws to make swords. They fed upon the fields and gardens of the people, from which they obtained corn for their horses and potatoes for their men. Marion's men annoyed the British by shooting at them from ambush. Yeah, I guess that would be rather an annoyance, wouldn't it? They broke up the British camps. They rescued American prisoners, captured horses and supply wagons. They avoided open battle, and it pursued every man scattered for himself into the swamps and woods to come together again at some place agreed upon. He was so difficult to follow that he became known as the Swamp Fox. Marion was of small stature and of few words. One wondered how he could be so great a soldier. His fame was never sullied by an act of cruelty, even to prisoners. Thomas Sumter was another leader in this wild and unusual warfare. He was a tall and powerful soldier and became known as the Gamecock. He hated the British because they had burned his house and turned his family out of doors. His men rode their own horses, wore hunting shirts, and were armed with long rifles, with which they could hit a mark the size of a man's hand at 200 paces. Another great general was Morgan, who was much like Sumter and Marion. He was an instinctive soldier, and during the war gained some brilliant victories. Yeah, Dan Morgan's another one of my favorite soldiers. I'm uh, reading a book about Morgan's men right now, recording it for you. won't be long for it's up on the site, too. On the side of the British was General Cornwallis, the best soldier that England sent to America. He had fought Green in all the campaigns of the North and had learned to respect him thoroughly. He said of him, Green is as dangerous as Washington. He is vigilant, enterprising, and full of resources. I never feel secure when camped in his neighborhood. Another British general was Lord Rawdon. He was now only 26 years of age, but he had already seen five years of unbroken service in America. The third officer of importance was Colonel Tarleton, who was also a young man of 26 years. Thus we see that the war in the South was ably conducted by the best soldiers on either side, and if there had been men and supplies, would have been one of the most notable campaigns in the history of the world. As it was, it was full of brilliant attacks and defenses, untiring marches, and skillful maneuvers. Such men as Green and Cornwallis could not fail the brilliant achievements. When, when Green took charge of the Southern Army, he wrote that it was rather a shadow than a substance, having only an imaginary existence. The numbers were small, there was no organization, no discipline, no equipment, and no supplies. The men had little or no clothing. There were few, if any, wagons, but little ammunition, and no money to buy supplies. There was only one blanket to every three soldiers, and they never had rations for more than three days at a time. The men were discouraged by defeat and were in the habit of going home whenever they chose. The outlook, at least, was most discouraging. But Green was not a soldier to lose heart or hope. Once Green spoke to a barefoot sentinel who in the dead of winter in the mountains of South Carolina was making his rounds with bleeding feet. You must suffer dreadfully from cold, said Green to the sentinel. Yes, sir, replied the soldier, not recognizing the general. But I don't complain. Our general suffers with us, and he's giving us all he can. At another time, Green, who had ridden all night long with a few soldiers, stopped at an inn which had been turned into a hospital. The landlady asked him how he was. He replied, hungry, tired, alone, and penniless. The landlady went to a room and, lifting a stone from the hearth, took out two bags of money she had saved and gave them to Green, saying, Take these. You and your men need the money, and I can do without it. Cornwallis had overrun George. Wasn't that a great example of generosity, though? That lady had saved a long time, no doubt, to save up two bags of money. 
And even though, you know, everybody has to have something to live on, she was willing to give it all up to General Green and his men. That is a patriotic sacrifice. Cornwallis had overrun Georgia and South Carolina and was pushing his way northward, hoping to make an easy conquest of North Carolina. He ordered a force of 1,200 men to make a raid into the western part of the state. The hardy backwoodsmen heard of his orders and began to gather in great numbers. They marched across the Alleghenies and from the defiles of the mountains, armed with rifles that rarely missed their marks. 3,000 of them gathered at King's Mountain and faced the British raiders. The British were on top of the mountain, and Ferguson, the British commander, cried out, They're two to one, boys, but the rebels cannot drive us from this place. The backwoodsmen, with grim determination, hitched their horses to the trees, loaded their rifles, and marched up the mountain from three sides. They advanced from tree to tree, taking deadly aim as they fired their guns. The British fell in great numbers, and Ferguson, seeing no chance of escape, raised a white flag in token of surrender. This was the Battle of King's Mountain. Then came the Battle of the Cowpens. This place was so called on account of an enclosure in which cows were kept. Colonel Tarleton had fortified himself there and was attacked by Morgan. The result was a great victory for Morgan. With a loss of only 11 killed and 61 wounded, he practically removed Tarleton's force from the ranks of the enemy. Morgan captured 600 prisoners, besides two field guns, 800 muskets, 35 wagons, 100 horses, and a large number of tents. And don't you know the starving American army could use all that stuff? Tarleton was cut across the face with a saber stroke, which left a scar. Later on, he remarked to someone that he heard that Morgan was a very illiterate man and that none of his soldiers knew how to write. A patriotic young woman, pointing to the scar upon his face, quietly remarked, Colonel, if they cannot write, they can at least make their mark. That's a pretty cute reply. Green's insufficient forces were not able to cope with the larger army and better discipline of the British regulars. In spite of his skill, reverses followed him at Guilford Courthouse, and he was compelled to retire to save his men from complete annihilation. Green was untiring and unsparing of himself. During the retreat from Guilford Courthouse, he did not sleep over four hours. While making the rounds one night during the time, he found the colonel in command of a large outpost asleep. Waking the exhausted officer, he inquired, how can you sleep when the enemy's behind us and we might be attacked at any time? The officer arose hurriedly, much abashed. General, I'm sorry. I've not slept in 48 hours, and besides, I knew that you would be awake. Both of them smiled, and Green passed on without further reproof. We now come to the siege of 96. This place has its name from being 96 miles from Kiwi, the principal village of the Cherokee Indians. It was little else than a frontier fort consisting of a stockade for defense against the Indians. The British held it under command of Colonel Kruger. Green invested the fort, hoping to reduce it before reinforcements could arrive. Marion was in the lower districts, and Sumter was somewhere beyond the Broad River. While the siege was in progress, a messenger arrived from Charleston, having covered 200 miles in four days, and brought news that Rawdon was marching against them. This was bad news. Green dispatched orders to Sumter to intercept Rawdon if he could, and also sent a messenger to Marion to hasten at once to 96. But neither Sumter nor Marion could stop the advance of the British, nor reach Green in time to help him. Green made every effort to reduce the fort, and soon had it so completely under his fire that the defenders could not go out for water during the daylight. Kruger resorted to the device of sending black slaves out by night, whose bodies would not be seen in the darkness. Kruger was in distress, and Green was hoping for his surrender. Kruger was seriously thinking of it, not knowing that Rawdon was on his way and would arrive in a short time. Green had taken care that he should get no news from the outside. One day a countryman rode into Green's lines and moved along conversing with the officers and men. He seemed harmless enough and swore loudly against the British whenever he had a chance. No attention was paid to him as he edged his way along leading a forlorn horse that had seen much riding. The man spoke of joining Green's regiment and was on the point of taking his place in the ranks. He had reached a favorable place, however, on the side of the stockade nearest the enemy, and suddenly mounting his horse, he put spurs to his animal and galloped toward the village stockade. 
He waved a letter in his hand, indicating to those in the fort that he was a messenger. They did not fire upon him, but Green's men did. Hundreds of bullets were sent after him, but leaning forward in the saddle, he escaped unhurt by some miracle. Falling from his wounded horse, he quickly made his way into the stockade and delivered his letter. It was dispatched from Rawdon to Kruger, saying, I passed Orangeburg and am in full march to raise the siege. Hold on as long as you can. Green now knew there was no hope of a surrender. He prepared for a speedy assault. The troops were all anxious to try it. His men were armed with rifles only, while the British themselves had several cannon. This assault was made with great bravery, but without success. Green withdrew his lines and began a retreat toward Charlotte. Rawdon arrived two days afterwards, very much to Kruger's relief. The siege of 96 had failed, but Green's army was intact. Rawdon now turned to pursue Green. But Green was not a soldier to be caught by anyone pursuing him. He desired to form a union with Sumter in order that he might proceed towards Orangeburg with his forces increased and draw Rawdon into another battle. Green needed a messenger to find Sumter, who was encamped at the watery. He wrote an order to General Sumter, saying, I've been compelled to abandon 96, and I'm on my way to Orangeburg. Rawdon is behind me. I shall lead him on, and if you will join me at Orangeburg, we can turn upon him and annihilate him. Hasten there with all speed. He looked around for a messenger. His men were absolutely worn out. The horses were hungry and gaunt, and the ride to Sumter would be long and severe. There were those who were willing to go, but Green shook his head in some doubt. I fear there is not a man here who has a horse strong enough or who himself is able to go the distance. Green had just passed the broad river, and his men had camped in their exhausted state were lying down, most of them, asleep. Near them was a farmhouse in which lived a young girl, 17 years of age, named Emily Geiger. She was interested in the coming of the soldiers and had wandered into Green's headquarters. She casually asked one of the officers, "'Can I do anything to help General Green? We're not Tories, and we despise the British.' The officer replied, "'There's nothing a girl can do, but we have work that some man can do.' "'What is that?' inquired the girl. "'The general wants a messenger to take an order to Sumter down on the watery. "'It's a country infested by Tories who love the British "'and will in all probability capture any messenger that's sent out. "'And besides, our men are all worn out.' "'Emily's face blazed with enthusiasm. "'Let me take the order. I have a good horse in my barn. "'I know the road and I know how to ride. Take me to General Green.' The officer led the girl before his commander. She repeated her offer and asked again to be sent to Sumter. It is one thing I can do for my country, said she. I'm not afraid, and besides that, no one will hurt a girl. Green was greatly surprised, but finally entrusted, oops, excuse me, consented to entrust the message to her. Read this very carefully and memorize it. Tell Sumter to join me at Orangeburg without fail. May the Lord help you to get through in safety. The girl took the letter and, going to her house, told her parents of her determination. They agreed with many misgivings, but she was very determined. She memorized the letter carefully, concealed it within her clothes, mounted her horse, and was off down the road. The first day passed without incident. She knew where she was going, took shortcuts through the woods and fields in order to avoid any soldiers whom she might meet. She stopped at farmhouses to feed her horse and herself and briefly told the women she met, I'm going south on business. What that business was, she would not disclose. It was nearing the middle of the second day. Emily's horse is making its way through a patch of woods when out of a thicket there leaped a redcoat, who stood in front of her with his musket. Halt, said the British soldier, and dismount. I have orders to stop anybody going this way. But I'm just a girl going south on business. I'm not a soldier. Why do you stop me? The orders are to stop everybody, said the man, and you might be a messenger for all I know. You come from Green's way and are now passing through Rawdon's picket lines. The man compelled the girl to dismount and lead her horse beside him as they went to a nearby house where lived a Tory woman, who, of course, was friendly to the British. Search this girl. She may have papers upon her that are important for us to have. If she gives a good account of herself, let her go on. If you find anything, let me know. The old woman nodded, and after the soldier had departed, told Emily to wait till she came back. The woman went into a back room for a moment, but Emily was alert to her danger and quickly drew the written order from her clothes and put it in her mouth. 
She chewed it rapidly and swallowed it, just as the woman returned to the room. It did not take long for the Tory woman to strip the girl and examine every part of her clothes. Not a thing was found. What is your name, my child? asked the woman. My name is Emily Geiger, was the truthful reply. Where do you come from? was the next question. Up on the broad river where my father lives. And where are you going? You a girl and alone through dangerous country. I'm going south on business for my father, and I'm not afraid of American soldiers or British soldiers. Nobody who dares hurt a girl who means no harm. The woman could make nothing more out of Emily. She was attracted by the gentle manner of the girl and her necessities. She let the horse feed in the barn and the girl eat at her table. Within an hour, Emily was off again on her mission, carefully avoiding the picket lines into which she had run. The next day, she reached Sumter on the watery and related her adventures. She described Green so accurately in his appearance, the condition of his men, and told her story so straight that he was forced to believe her. He put his men in motion at once toward Orangeburg, where, in due course of time, he joined General Green. We need not follow the adventures of the war much farther. Cornwallis veered off to Virginia, where he met his fate at Yorktown. Rawdon was ordered north, and Green practically had his way from that time on in the south. All the outposts in Georgia and Carolina were captured, and the British were shut up in Charleston and Savannah. Had it not been for the ride of Emily Geiger, Sumter would not have joined Green at Orangeburg, and the plans of the British in the South might not have been changed to their disaster. And that's the end of our podcast for today, little buddies. Again, this story came from, it's a true story, it came from a book called With Whip and Spur, Stories of Famous Horse Rides Throughout American History. I think you will love it as much as I did, don't you? So, if you haven't joined the Uncle Rick Audio Book Club, wouldn't today be a great day to talk to your mom and dad about joining? Only $10 a month and you get two whole audio books to download and listen to Uncle Rick's charming voice. Plus, we've got our new video section up. Lots of great stuff that you will enjoy. And you'll learn some things, too. Anyway, I got to go for now, but I look forward to reading to you again next week. So I will say, as I always do, always put God first in your life. Be a patriotic American and honor thy father and thy mother. So long. Parents. If your kids enjoyed their visit with Uncle Rick, know that they will love the Uncle Rick Audiobook Club. The Uncle Rick Audiobook Club allows access to dozens more stories, both from history and the Bible, to help your kids learn about godly character. Here's what one parent had to say about the book club. My children love the stories. They make history so interesting. My son says it is because of the details that most textbooks don't include. Uncle Rick is easy to listen to. We love his accents and explanations. Thank you so much for that testimony. If you'd like to learn more about the Uncle Rick Book Club, please join us over at UncleRickAudios.com. That is UncleRickAudios.com. See you there.